It's Tim Albright with Aviation at ISC 2017. I'm Paul from Aurora Multimedia. How are you, sir? Doing well, thank you for coming by. Absolutely, absolutely. You, you, here's the thing, Paul is one of the smartest guys that I know, period. Oh, be quiet, you are. <laughs> um, started a company uh, you know, from scratch. Uh, I have a lot of respect for that. Um, you know, everything that you see behind me is, is it came out of that head. Um, one of the first folks to use the AptoVision um, Blue River Trip takes 10 gig, I'm sorry, takes 4K down and it gets it under, under 10 gig. You call it IP base T, cool. right? You're a founding member of S the SDVOE Alliance. Not a founding, but, uh, but you're a member. part of it. But you're a member of, of it. Um, so let's have a conversation, first of all, about 4K video on the network. Okay. First of, my first question is, is it necessary? Do we have to do, do we have to do 4K on the network? Well, by today's standards, because the home market's pushing um, the, uh, the 4K content with the 4K screens, so because the display manufacturers have made it very apparent that is the way they're going, people want to obviously put the content that goes pixel for pixel to the 4K screens. So that by that alone, it defines the fact that we have to do 4K over the networks rather than just something like a 1080p or something to that effect. Or more than, more than just a HDMI um, cable. Correct. Well, one of the advantages that, that the IP is giving us right now is the flexibility for scalability. So we can now break the confines of your typical 4x4, 8x8, 16x16. All those rules are going out the window. And that also lowers the price points as well because there's no more proprietary card cages and things of that nature. So this is the beginning of the end of the card cage as we know it. Hmm. Interesting, interesting. Um, one of the things that on this show's for specifically, and I, I feel like it's more so this year than, than any other trade show, is there are a lot of folks that are arguing against 10 gig. Um, there's a lot of, of solutions that are compressing the, the 4K stream down to under one gig, right? Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that, and if you look at it, it, it from a video standpoint, actual motion, you know, a movie or whatever, um, it looks pretty good, right? What are some of the dangers, though, <laughs> of taking 4K and, and getting it under that 10 gig? Right. Well, one of, one of the things that I, I've seen a lot of companies make a mistake with, which we'd like to think that we uh, kind of try to solve, and this is really what the whole point of ip based T is about, is we think that every standard out there has a purpose, and they're all great, but they all have their disadvantages as well. Okay. So you're not going to record with a 10 gig signal. You're going to use an H.264 or an H.265 but you're not gonna use an H.264 and H.265 for local infrastructure because it has too much compression in it, uh, color space conversion, uh, latencies that you just don't want, where a one gig solution is gonna make sense. And then you get into the broadcast industries, the medicals, the command and controls, or just things where you need certain levels of detail, and that's where the 10 gig comes into play. So you really need a little bit of everything, because right now there's nothing that exists that scales from as low as, let's say, a Dante, which is a very low bandwidth for audio specifically, all the way up to a 10 gig, which is going to give you that pure, um, you know, very low compression signal. So when you get to the higher resolutions, like 4K 6444, you really don't want to do that over a one gig at 60 hertz because the compression becomes so high, you're going to start to see artifacts. You're getting 16 to one or higher just to achieve that. And when you blow that up onto a 60 inch screen and you try to do smaller font characters, they're going to look like hieroglyphics. I mean, it's, it's not going to look good, and colors are going to change. And so while it might look great with video, in the commercial world where it's not just about video, it's about computers and other things that are static images with fine details, it's going to show its true colors. Where things aren't moving around and hiding themselves anymore, they're actually become very apparent, and the original versity content is going to be there, and it is going to become definitive, and it's going to become unacceptable. So 10 gig really is the way it has to go. Now, another point that no one's thinking about is the future. Everybody keeps talking about 8K already. Now, are we really there yet? No, but everybody we're always We're starting wants, to be. We, we're starting to be, but people want to future-proof. They're always we're talking, everyone's a future-proof, even though realistically, there really is no way to ever truly future-proof. No, but there's a way to say, okay, um, you know, back to my technology manager's day, technology manager days, we had Half-Life, right? We would, when we installed a system, you wanted yes. it to last at least X amount of time. Some For some folks, that's five years. Some folks, that's nine or ten years. Mm -hmm. So I think that some of that is, is 
the future proof is relative, right? Correct. And that's kind of what you know. I think Correct. a lot of people are, are saying. And you give me a great lead into what I'm talking about. So when I talk to people about networking and using these IP solutions for the AV over IP, really what we're talking about here is the infrastructure is the most important part of the system, not just the boxes that go on it. As much as I love everybody to buy all my boxes, uh, it really is about the network infrastructure. Uh, the cabling is important. You use a CAT 6A and you follow the standard rules that will give you 100 meters uh, for 10 gig uh, networks. Uh, use a 10 gig uh, backbone. We've already proven that you can do 4K 60, 444 with very low compression on a 10 gig. So that means 8, 8K is highly effective even on a 10 gig system as well because what's the compression going to be? I was, was going to say, what? Because here's the thing, 4K, is 16 gig you know, un uncompressed with all the other stuff. It's actually more about 13 once you take away all the nonsense. Yeah. So if you think about it, you're just trying to get 13 gigs right down to below 10 gigs. So then what is the 8K then? But, but here's the beautiful thing about it. People always think of visually lossless. When you're at that low level of a compression, you're actually making it um, uh, lossless compression. There's a difference between compression, lossy compression and lossless compression. That means that when, when they're doing it, they're actually taking it and they're, they're it's, the best way I like to describe it is you're putting a bitmap into a zip. It compresses the heck out of it. But when you take it back out the other way, you still got all the information right there. Okay. Okay. The type of compression when you're that low doesn't have to become where it affects the actual pixels of the content. So when it decompresses, you lost nothing. So it is actually true to its form. The only thing you incur is a penalty of a little bit of latency, which is 100 microseconds. That's like five lines of horizontal lines. That's, that's nothing. So if you think about it, to go to 8K, well, let's say you gotta double the compression. Okay. okay, let's say you do start to introduce a little bit of lossy. Wait, what are you worst case, six to one? That's still nothing. I'm doing eight to one and it looks beautiful. As long as you don't get to that nine to one and above, you're actually doing okay for yourself. So at six to one, you're doing 8K on a 10 gig. You still don't need to go. I know some people talk, well, oh, we'll go 40 gig, we'll go 100 gig. It might not actually be that necessary even for 8K. So there is a better roadmap to get to the point where people are trying to go. Interesting. All right, um, so we, we, you and I can sit here and talk about video all day. You've got, obviously, encoders and decoders that help do that. The other thing you've got is you have probably one of the more intuitive uh, control systems. Thank you. And that's actually where you start, right? Uh, yeah, actually where I started was a little gizmo that played back two minute clips of, um, of audio called the iOS. Okay. And it stood for I Only Speak. And what's funny about it is the, the intent was it was it was supposed to actually be uh, to enunciate for like when you put a touch panel on its base for mm -hmm. recharging and it would say, please return the touch panel on its base for recharging. Sounds like it makes a lot of sense. Never quite caught on, but we use it as our doorbell now when you walk into our building and it plays the Jetsons. Nice. How to put it to use, but it's been running now for, in this building that we're in right now, it's been there for almost 14 years running 24 seven playing the Jetsons. So if you ever come to my building and you hear the Jetsons, that was one of the first early products I ever made running 24 seven so playing running. the Jetsons. So I found the use for it. it. Wasn't one of my better seller products, but it's a fun product. So let's talk about you know, your, your product line and your, you've got, you pretty, have a pretty diverse product line. Um, everything, like we talked about already, the video compression, you have, you know, just, not, not regular switchers, but switchers that, that you know, switch HDMI and, um, you know, traditional um, non-network based Correct. Uh, video. When you're looking at a new dealer or a de new dealer is working, looking at you, mm -hmm. how does that relationship develop? Is this something where you're going out looking saying, you know what, I don't have anybody in Nebraska or I don't have anybody in Chicago. Mm -hmm. I need to find some, or is it something where they come to you and say, you know what, Paul, we're looking at your stuff. You know, we'd like to start partnering with you. A little bit of both. Okay. I mean, uh, it depends. Uh, we have salespeople, we have sales reps. Uh, we're global, so we have distributors. Uh, obviously, their jobs are to go out and find people. But then when you go to trade shows and things like that and they get, uh, they like what they see, then they pretty much uh, just say, hey, I'd like to become a dealer of yours. Uh, what kind of, so it's kind of a little bit of both. It, it, it's both directions. But usually the good, the good relationships that I find are the, you know, I, I like it. Uh, my more fun relationships are the ones that I say the cooler heads prevail, where we got a job to do, things are going to go right, things are going to go wrong, um, and the key is to get to the fruition where the customer's happy. And the people with that mindset and that attitude, are, I always find, are, are some of the best dealers to work with. And there's a lot of them out there, and that's when, it, when your job becomes really fun, is that you know that in good times things are great, and even when the, you know what hits the fan, you can still go in there, achieve a successful result, and walk out of there with everybody still going wrong. As everybody's been doing this for a long time, you know that nothing ever goes right on the job. There's always something, whether it's your fault or someone else's, 
at the end of the day, it really shouldn't matter whose fault it is. It's a matter of you're going to make it look good for everybody in the end so that the end user is happy, so that everybody gets that next project. And the key is to make sure the end user doesn't have to become part of the, that experience when things don't go right. So those are the type of deals I actually like the most and I look forward to the most are just the ones who have that good positive attitude and don't do the blame game and just, uh, you know. Those are the people you want to keep doing business with. Oh, without a doubt. It, it's not about the size of the companies. I, I work with small companies to large. And I know some people get all giddy and, and oh, I got the large company. You know what, sometimes the small guys, they could be extremely innovative. They got some projects that are very clever and it, and it keeps life interesting. Um, so it's really more just a, about the relationship more than anything. Um, I, I gladly take a good relationship over just a, a super big relationship that just makes you miserable. Absolutely. Uh, people have come through your, your booth, good, good traffic this week? Oh, excellent traffic. It's been a great show, um, good volume through here. I, I can't complain. Um, each year, uh, this is our fourth year doing the show. Each year we come back, we, we keep finding and understanding the uh, the market here because it is different than the United States. Uh, so you have to learn how to, you know, you, you got to appreciate that their culture and the way that they do things is not exactly what works for you and the way you want to do things. So I get to take some of that back. Some of our ideas are really good. I get to incorporate them. Sometimes I just ask things that you just never thought of that. It's like, wow, you know what? Uh, glad someone finally asked that. So it, it's really nice to have the diversity. So if, like if somebody walks through, if, if you had a group of folks walk through here, what do you hope they, they took away from your, from your stand? Besides uh, a brochure. The, uh, or a, the, or a the desire to buy millions of dollars worth of my products. Okay. See that one? Got that oh, plug in there. Oh, man. All right. <laughs> if somebody wants to buy millions of dollars of your product, how do they do that? No, so what, what usually what happens is when I bring people in it, the first thing I like to do is I just like to be as truthful as we could be, which is I try to do things like, like this presentation behind us. I show the original, I show the results in a real world so that they can make the determination for themselves what they really think of the product. Not just the same old, oh, it's the best thing in the world, my God, you gotta use it because we have the XYZ technology. It sounds impressive, but at the end of the day, you really gotta put up or shut up. So I like these type of presentations because it's a put up or shut up presentation. So they can walk away from you saying, I saw it, I lived it, I know it, and I, and I believe that it actually does it. It's not just a lot of talk. Yeah. It really does work. It really does what we say it does. So uh, what I try to get taken away is, real, realistically, from at least for this show, is the fact that we're changing the typology AV. And that's really what I'm looking for people to understand. That's about a big statement, dude. It is, and I think we actually achieved it. Uh, and that was the whole point of IP Base T, was we didn't want to just become another reference design. One of the problems that happens in commercial AV is everybody's selling to everybody, uh, and a lot of people are buying from China and putting their name on it, and there's a lot of companies out there that aren't real manufacturers anymore. They're just people who slap their silk screens. You've seen it plenty of times in the ads where, hey look, isn't that the box on that page? Hey, it is, and you flip the pages and it's the same box, just a different silk screen. Um, it's some guy possibly working out of his house or a small little company, doesn't have the overhead of some larger companies who need to support themselves, and uh, they're just buying it and they're just dumping it onto the market, selling it on the internet. That does a disservice to the industry because what it's really doing is uh, it's turning integrators uh, into installers rather than selling the entire solution because the customer goes in and says, oh look, I could buy that for five points above whatever their cost is, but this guy's selling it for you know this amount and I don't want it from him. The industry is its own worst enemy. And I try my best to avoid that situation where we don't just sell to everybody and anybody. We want the, the dealers to be able to uh, be able to properly support a product because the proper margins are in there to do what they need to do and uh, to want to sell our product. Uh, they deserve to, to make money and they deserve to be able to sell the product that they're installing. And so we pride ourselves on that. But one of the things that we are actually trying to do here is we're redefining how AV is done. The whole industry has been brainwashed into, oh, we got to use card cages because that's the way to go. It's going to make the system smaller and better and it's going to be so much easier. I'll ask you a question. When's the last time you've seen a customer buy a spare part to keep on their own site? When I was a tech manager. Okay, and you know why that is? Look at the average, uh, and I'm not gonna pick on any particular company, because we're guilty of it as well. We ha we've had our card cage share of stuff as well, but this is why we're moving away from it. You got the card cage, the proprietary. Yep. Then you got the HDMI input card, HD base T well, input the cards, card. The cards, period, yeah. Oh yeah, HDMI output card, HD base T output card, the box, the wall plate, the ethernet switch. That's eight different SKU numbers right off the bat just to get going. Yeah. Okay, now, can you patch, if the HDMI input fails to the output that's using HDBC, can you just patch around it? No, you lost the ability to patch too. So what did Card Cage really give you? It gave you a proprietary system that you can't patch around, 
that you can't keep extra spare parts because there's so many parts to make it work. And because it's a card cage, it's actually increasing the complexity and the failure points of things being actually inserted into it. Now take what we've done. The first thing that we've done is, uh, yeah, I'll grab one of my boxes here, okay? So one of the things that we did is, we got rid of the whole transmitter receiver. There's only one SKU to actually install. So it does both? So it does both. You tell it what you want it to be. Okay. So right off the bat, we've simplified the SKUs. So no more stock disproportions, no more millions of parts. So worst case you could possibly have is if you take one of these wall plates, for example, this happens to be a 10 gig wall plate. Yeah, by the way, only 10 gig wall plate. <laughs> so, uh, hey, got to throw a plug in there. Absolutely. So, um, but if you think about it, what's the worst case part count? Network switch, which are usually highly reliable, wall plate and a box. And the wall plates are transceivers too. Customer can actually buy a spare wall plate, keep it on site, and even if a box goes out, you can temporarily put a, a wall plate where the box is. Yeah. So we've simplified it. So it actually, a, a, an installer can actually go onto site, they can grab the spare part if they need it, replace it, and then bring it back with them while it gets fixed in the background instead of telling the customer, sorry, manufacturer won't be able to take care of it for three weeks or two months, and then they're with the down system. Better customer satisfaction, and then you get into the troubleshooting. I have an encoder, an encoder, a decoder, a decoder. I can grab a decoder, turn it into an encoder to prove if that point, if that part's working or not. So you're changing the way you do serviceability. And then you do something else that's interesting. We're changing the way that people think about moving data or the, the video content. Because these are transceivers, you can reverse the direction. You can't do that with today's system. So yeah. I can have a wall plate here, a wall plate there, a box up by the projector. I can take that wall plate, send it to the projector, and also tell that wall plate to become a decoder and send it to that wall plate, put another monitor there. You can't do that with today's systems. So it's, it adds new enhancements that you couldn't even do before. Uh, so that's another problem it actually solves. And then we got Dante as an option that you could put into it. Now you can take the audio, keep it digital. Don't even go out into the audio de-embedding anymore. Feed it into a Dante mixer, it stays pure IP. Feed it, mix it, put it back into the room, keep it in the total IP domain. So we solved that problem. USB, full 480 megabits a second. Not only can we send it from point A to point B, but one of the biggest problems that people haven't solved is a lot of products are predetermined which side the computer goes on versus the device. Yep. And the, the manufacturer's choice determines that. This is reversible. You can actually tell it which direction the USB is going in. And so that's another industry first that we did. And then we did, actually we just introduced it at the show uh, for the first time here. When we developed this technology two years ago, we gave it the ability to do 10 gig PoE. And Huawei, which is one of our partners for ip based team, developed a 10 gig PoE uh, Ethernet switch. So, but now, whereas we've been having this technology that's been unusable for two years because we didn't have a switch to match it, yeah. now, and this goes back to your other thing before, the viability of 10 gig, it's starting. And we're, I'm, I'm pleased to say we're the beginnings of this, but we've showing and demonstrating that 10 gig with PoE has a viable place, that it's not just a pipe dream because it's a server class switch, that this is now showing that peripherals do need PoE and that there is a marketplace for it. And 10 gig uh, switch, 10 gig uh, units that do the 4K or 8K or whatever is to come are actually going to be the first peripheral that really demonstrates the viability of using PoE over 10 gig so you don't have to put power all over the place. And that's what, uh, excuse me, that demonstrates. Um, and so, yeah, I'm pleased. It's not just an industry first, it's a world's first. It's just no one's done it before. So that, I'm, I'm kind of happy about that because I can honestly say that, you know, in the next few months to come when this becomes uh, more popular uh, and more people try to do what we did because it is POE and other people yeah. are going to eventually do it to match up the way we did, I can actually say I was the first to do it and we showed that it can be done and we helped get that going in the industry. So it really is nice. And so when I say I'm changing the uh, typology AV, I've proven that you can no longer need the card cage, you can increase the reliability, a box goes out, it doesn't take a, an entire frame out, just the box goes out. Everything else keeps working. Yeah. You want to replace something, we simplified it. You want to do full breakaway with no matter where you want to go, you can do it. You want to make it fully scalable to go wherever you want, you can do that too. I've spoke to thousands of people, and no one's been able to put a hole in the concept yet, and that's when it makes it a real typology change. Yeah. And no one's been able to do it. And you could try to do it too, no. if you want. Dude, but, I told you, um, you're one of the smartest guys good. I know. I ain't gonna do that. So. so one of the things I'd like to see more than anything for Aurora, more than growth or anything else like that, is just at some point look, when people look back and say, wow, you know, Aurora put a lot of concepts out there that was never done before, and they're, they're showing the industry that there's a better way of doing things 
uh, out there. Yeah. Well, you're, you're on your way. So thank, thank you. you so much. How, how do people, seriously, in all seriousness, if somebody wants to buy a million dollars worth of Aurora, <laughs> how, how do they do that? How do they get a hold of you? Uh, go to auroramultimedia.com. So it's uh, www.auroramm.com. Get all the contact information from there. You can see uh, stuff about our products. And I promise you, Infocom, it's going to be really exciting there. Uh, I hope you're covering me on Infocom yeah, as well. We'll, well yeah. um, and it's going to be a really exciting show. we got some new tricks up our sleeves, and uh, I promise you there'll be something even new and interesting that will impress you. All right. Paul Harris from, from Aurora Multimedia. My name is Tim Albright. For more information about us, go to avnation.tv.